Tonight, we're over the moon to be hosting Louise Penny, the number one New York Times and Globe and Mail best-selling author of 10 previous Chief Inspector Armand Gamache novels. She's won numerous awards, including a CWA Dagger and the Agatha Award five times, and was a finalist for the Edgar for Best Novel. She lives in a small village south of Montreal. We're also lucky enough to be joined by Terry Tazzioli. Terry's a longtime journalist and co-author of, of a New York Times bestseller, Volcano, The Eruption of Mount St. Helens. He's currently the co-host of Well Read. Please help me in welcoming Louise Penny and Terry Tazzioli. While Terry wrestles with that, which could be about 20 minutes, I'm going to take a photograph. Can, can, look at all the, who are you anyway? Look at all these people. I, this is, these are my close personal friends. Can you hear us back there? It's my family. Somebody's holding up. Are you waving or saying, I can't hear? Wow. I can't hear you either. <laughs> look at this. Hi, back row. Are you okay? Can you, can you hear? You, we're we're going to use our loud... You're in the front row, and you're saying you can't hear. Can you guys hear us at the back? All right, good. Okay. Now, I have a question for you, or a request. Do, you, do, do most of you already have copies of the book? Yes. yes. Oh, good. My book? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Could you hold them up? Because I, I have to say, I need to prove... Oh! Look at that. <laughs> That's great. great. This is the world launch, by the way. The world, you're the first people in the world. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Um, this is, I'm sending it to, oh, you're so attractive. <laughs> I'm sending it, I'm not immediately, I'm going to be sending it to uh, my publisher um, to prove that I showed up. <laughs> so it's a nice good night. <laughs> I, I'm, um... If you see me holding my notes way over here, there's a reason for that. Um, Louise was on the show a year, about a year, yeah, ago, a year ago with the um, Long Way Home, which I'm sure most, if not all of you, have read. And, and she shows up, and this her usual wonderful self. I'd never met you before. <laughs> and thinking, I think I like this person right off the bat. So I have my little notes on the table between the the two of us, and I, um, I asked the first question, and Louise just took off with the answer, and I'm listening, and I'm thinking, oh, that's great. There goes question number one, and <laughs> there goes question number two, and there's question number three, four, and five, and six. So I, get your hands off that. <laughs> so, so I looked at her, like, when she finished, I said, oh, thanks a lot. You just, you just ruined the show. You've answered all of my questions in the first two minutes of the program. And so Louise reaches over, this is why they're down here, grabs the notes, goes like this, and says, good, now let's talk. <laughs> we so had the most fun. We had a great Didn't time. We have a riot. I mean, isn't Terry just the most, I mean, I'm sure many of you know him. He's just, I'm a fan. You're <laughs> That was the eight viewers of Well Read. And <laughs> I'm hoping that we get about 10 or 12 more after tonight. Okay, here we go with, um, with this book. Um, we, talked, we talked before because I, I, I really wanted to know what to be able to say about it and what not to get into because I think most of you probably haven't read it yet. Just and <laughs> what we talked about was fiction and historical fiction and taking things which you've done with, with other of the great inspectors life, there are moments in, in the books 
and they are for most fiction writers, when something is coming out of history. Yes. And you have to play with that. I, that's true. I've done it. I'm, I'm presuming, and I, I don't want to give anything, and I certainly won't. I'm very aware of spoilers, so, so not to worry. But I, um, in past books, I've certainly taken events from Canadian history. It gives me great pleasure. I love history. And I'm, I'm, I love Canadian history. And there's a, there's a, um, a sense, certainly within Canada, that Canada has no history. As when I was, I mean, how can you be around for 200, 300 years and not have a history? But we were never taught it. We were taught American history and we were taught British history and we were taught that our own history was essentially non-existent. And that, the stuff that we were taught was so unbelievably stultifyingly dull that we came to believe it. But it was later in life that I realized that's just not the case. So it gives me such pleasure to be able to take events from Canadian history and examine them, and not necessarily celebrate them, because a lot shouldn't be celebrated, but at least say, this is what happened. Isn't, isn't this remarkable? Uh, in Bury Your Dead, one of them was uh, Champlain, who was the founder of not just Quebec, but of, of Canada. And, and somehow, after he died, mm -hmm. we, we lost his body. <laughs> I mean, we know where nuns are buried, we know where soldiers are buried. How can you lose the founder? <laughs> it's a good, I mean, it's like you saying, now where did we put Washington? <laughs> you know, we're pretty sure he died. <laughs> we don't know where he is. So that, that was kind of the launching off point. And with another book, it was the Dion Quints. Do many of you know the Dion Quints? Yeah, yeah. I just, it's hard to tell sometimes how widespread some, some events in Canadian history. And this was recent history. In fact, some of the quints are still alive. Um, so that was the starting off point. But I, I couldn't really base it um, in a documentary fashion on the quints uh, because I had my own dramatic needs. But it was such a remarkable story. So I made up my own quints. But in the author's note, I made it clear mm -hmm. And, and anyone who knows the Dion Quins would know that it was inspired by their, their story. Uh, and in this book, there's a similar example of something taken from recent Canadian history that when I heard about it back in the mid-1990s, I thought was so extraordinary it couldn't possibly be true. Now, I was a journalist at the time, and I couldn't believe it. And I had seen a lot of unbelievable things, but this was a step too far. Uh, it turned out that it was true. And so I sort of, I, I planted it away in my mind when I became a writer. I thought, one, one day I might be able to tell the story. But as you know, part of the problem with um, truth is that it often is actually stranger than fiction. So how do you tell a story that is so extraordinary it is actually unbelievable um, and make it believable? So one of the th ways that I've figured out how to do it and I, and I hope that I, I achieved it, because my editor and I discuss this a great deal, how do you make the unbelievable believable, is, is in having the characters like Gamache and Beauvoir and some of the others react as you might react, and react as I reacted, and that was, I don't believe it. So they themselves didn't believe it and needed to be convinced. And so I'm, I'm sort of hoping that that makes it a more believable, but it was, it was a lot of fun. But basically what I did was, I struggled, you and I just talked about this, I, and I'm not, I'm not totally sure that I, I reach, I struggle with it in each book, I don't know that I, I, I do it correctly or, or I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the correct conclusion, but I struggle with how much I owe to the truth of what really happened, because I am taking actual people from, from history how closely I have to hew to the truth and how much leeway I have to fictionalize it, to say, what if? Yeah, this happened, but then what if? So that's, it's, there's always that kind of tension as I'm writing it, and, and that was certainly the case in this book. The inspector, Gamash is not real, but after all these books, he is so real and so human. Oh, thank you. How has he changed? over the years, including this story. Yeah, it, um, it's an interesting question because 
Gamache is kind of the after picture. You know, you, many of us live lives a certain way, and then there is a catastrophic event often in our lives, like a great loss, um, whether it's a loss of, of someone we love or a loss of a, a lifestyle or something that makes us re-examine ourselves and who we are. And sometimes you come out the other side of that. Many people come out the other side embittered and angry. Uh, some people come out the other side of it more compassionate. And Gamache has come out the other side more compassionate. And so, and, and actually when we meet him in still life, that's already happened. So the, the, the catastrophic events are, are for the most part behind him in life. But then as we follow through still life and through a fatal grace, more and more things build up to challenge that compassion until finally it explodes again in, a, in, a, in another series of events. And so again, he has to regroup. And much of that regrouping happens in the book previous to this, The Long Way Home, where he retires because he's just shattered and he needs to find peace. And he finds it in this little village of three pines. Um, in this book, he's still retired, but he now has caught his breath. And one of the themes that, that weaves its way through this particular book is he's still, he's only, some would say miraculously, in his mid-50s still. <laughs> <laughs> Not me, but please continue. <laughs> well, I was saying, uh, he and I don't seem to be aging. <laughs> So he's, he's retired, he's, but he's a vigorous man with, with a lot to contribute still, and so the leap motif through this, or one of them, is what, it, what next? What next? Mm -hmm. And he, he, in one conversation he has with Myrna, he, he admits that this is a question that is, he feels is imposed on him by others. Other people are saying, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? And for him, he doesn't feel that need, but he, he's beginning to feel guilty. He's beginning to feel that he needs to answer that. Um, and so he's beginning to sort of look around at some of the options. And, and Jean Guy and some of the others are throwing out suggestions like greeter at Walmart and some other <laughs> <laughs> helpful things. Um, and, and that sort of gathers speed as the, as the book goes on as well. But I think that also came from, because I am at that age, and a lot of my friends are at that age, my, my siblings are at that age, and contemplating early retirement, but again, they are vigorous, they're smart, they're intelligent, they have at least 20 years, maybe 25 years of contribution still to be made ahead of them. So they're asking, what now? What now? Now is the chance to do what you really love to do. But you've also got 50 years of, of others telling you what you should be doing. So you have, they have to scrape away all that and, and get at what do I really want to do? Not what's going to be imposed on me, but what gives me joy? Because now this is my turn now. And so it's, it's quite interesting to write Gamash going through that. And at the end, I won't tell you, but, but it is... A, uh, there, there are some hints as to what he, what he decides to do in the next book. Hints, hints is a word I would use. I would use some, Are you in love with this guy? Ah! <laughs> Jerry! My <laughs> God! I am. As a matter of fact. <laughs> is anyone else here in love with Gamash? <laughs> you hussies. <laughs> You have competition. I have competition. <laughs> yes, and I, that was actually deliberate. I, I, I created a group when I, when I started to sit down to, to write Still Life. I didn't think it was going to be published. So I thought, I was pretty sure that the writing of the book was going to have to be reward enough. So I decided that I had to create a village I would choose to live in. This was shortly after 9-11. And the, where I, I was feeling, like many of us, quite threatened and that the world was a dangerous and uncertain place where, where you could be going about your regular life and terrible things could suddenly fall out of the sky. Um, and so I, I was feeling the need for comfort and for community and for a sense of belonging. 
And so I created a village I would choose to live in where, where kindness was a currency, where, where, where goodness existed. Um, and I chose, I created a, a group of characters I would choose as friends, who's, who I wanted to hang around with. Um, the first thing I, I created in the village when I was, I remember sitting there thinking, sort of designing the, 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 the layout of it. And the first thing I knew that it would have was the bookstore. What more, before food even, what do you need? You need books. Then I created the bistro, very shortly after that. And then after the bistro, because it's not enough to have a bistro, you need a bakery. <laughs> Poissons. Um, and then for the main character. This was hard on the heels of um, hearing, and I don't know that this is true or not, it's a kind of a, a, a myth perhaps, but so many myths are true, uh, that Agatha Christie grew weary of Poirot. Uh, I don't, and again, I don't know if this is true, but I thought how sad if it is, and that I, if I'm lucky enough that the books are published, that still life is published, and that I then go on to have a career, and that these characters go on to have lives. Um, I don't want to be in that position where I grow tired of my main character. So I thought, I need to create a character I would marry. <laughs> and so I created cool. Armand Gamache. Let's flip it over. Who's your favorite bad guy? Oh. Because there are bad people in yes. these books. Do you know, I think, there, I'm very inspired by, by poetry, as you know, and I use a lot of poetry in the books. And, and one of the poets I read, whether I use it or not in the books, I read um, a lot of Yeats, and I read, and who I actually quote in this book, and Auden. And there's a, a, a line from Auden's, um, 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 it's an elegy to Melville, where the lines, goodness existed, um, that was the new knowledge. His terror had to blow, him, blow itself quite out to let him see it. And that, that's actually at the heart of all of the books, is that, that couplet. The terror exists. 9-11 happened. Terror exists. But so does goodness. And that was my new knowledge. And that's what I wanted to bring to the books. And that's, that's what the books are about. They're about terror. But at the end of the day, it's about goodness. And the price we pay for that goodness and how much more difficult it is to be good and kind than it is to be cruel. It, it takes no character at all to say something cruel. It takes no intelligence at all to find fault. It takes a great deal more to see the fault, but to choose to say something kind anyway. Um, but they, the lines that actually, so that's those, those lines inspire the entire series, uh, but the lines that, that um, and in terms of my favorite bad character, come from later on in that, in that poem. And it's, um, um, oh God, I can't even remember, but that, 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 that he ran, he, he met kindness every day, uh, even among a crowd of faults. And that, for me, the bad guys aren't drooling and frothing and they're not, Obvious, they don't have blood dripping from them. In this case, the nature of the beast, the beast is us, and the nature is human nature. And so, my favorite bad guys are, are often appear to be the good guys. And so, one of my favorite bad guys was Peter Moro, Clara's husband. And I, I understood Peter, and I, 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 I liked writing him because I understood. Uh, the great ambivalence he felt, that he loved Clara with all of his heart, but he had this shard of jealousy that, that stole everything good. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really loved writing that duality of, of Peter. So he was, uh, he was my favorite bad guy. Mm -hmm. the, the, there are other bad guys that were interesting to write, and they really challenged Gamache, and challenged Gamache's sense of, of decency and integrity, and really pushed him, and, and he, you know, he came so close to, to murdering, um, and, and, and actually, well, anyway, I won't go, because some of you haven't read <laughs> some yeah. of the books. Um, but yeah, I would say Peter is probably my favorite bad guy. It, is it fair to say, well, for me, 
the, the book is, was crawling with suspects. And I have given up three or four or five books ago trying to figure out who did this because I'm always wrong. I'm always wrong. And so I thought I knew, and then I thought I knew, and then I stopped and said, stop this. You're just going to wreck the book. So then I just sat there for X numbers of hours and you know, trying to figure How do you keep all these people straight? Oh, my God. Terry, you wouldn't believe it. My first drafts, I write about four or five, maybe six drafts of every book. And my first drafts are pieces of something very soft and smelly. <laughs> it's not pieces, mountains of the stuff. I'm just, I'm about two thirds of the way through the first draft of, of the next book. And I'll tell you, it's a piece of, you know what. But mostly because the, when I wrote the second book, I was terrified. Uh, the first book, Still Life, took me 45 years to write. It, it was an act of such love. And that was the contract I had with my younger self when I realized at the age of eight I wanted to write, was just write a book. And I thought after I passed 40, 45, that it wasn't going to happen. Um, and then it did, and it just seemed like an act of grace, uh, an act of God, a, div a divine gift. And then I had to write the second book in a year. I remember my agent calling me up when, I, when she got the contract. She said, you know, I have good news, Louise. And she, she's British, so she speaks with a British accent, which to my Canadian ear, there's a kind of an implied, every time she speaks to me, there's an implied, you idiot. <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. So she said, I have wonderful news, Louise. I've, I've, I've signed, I've sold three books. And I said, my God, Teresa, congratulations, mine, and who else's? <laughs> and she said, well, they're all yours, you idiot. <laughs> oh my God, Teresa, how could you do that to me? I had, I, had, I had literally had, by then, less than a year to write the second book. And I didn't know how I'd written the first book. <laughs> So I, I was petrified, and I wrote the first draft of what became a Fatal Grace, and it was awful. And now the deadline is coming, because I have, I have to deliver the book, and now it's like three or four months away, and, it's and I know it's terrible. And it's, it's heartbreaking to me, because I've just been handed everything I have ever dreamed of. A big, well, not big, actually, to be honest, but a publishing contract with a big New York agency. And, you know, I'd already had the sandwich, so I'd spent the advance. So <laughs> I had to deliver the second book. And it was awful. And I, my heart was breaking. I didn't know, because I knew I was writing from fear. Now, fear might drive some people to great creative. Really? Mm -hmm. Are you more creative when you're... Oh, absolutely. I was a reporter all of my life, and <laughs> I wait for the deadline, and then there's total panic, and then out it comes. Really? Mm -hmm. You see, I don't... I, I, I don't necessarily... I, I guess I do kind of freeze. I don't want to admit it, but I... What, what happens to me when I get fearful is I fall back on, into my comfort zone, which is then writing to please other people rather mm. than writing from a place of taking chances, you know, really being open, open to inspiration. And I know that that's what I did. I got to the end of the first draft, and it was okay. It probably would have even been accepted, but it wasn't what it could have been and should have been. And so I, I went to a, a, a therapist, <laughs> and I, I said, I don't know what to Here, do. write this. Because I was afraid that I was going to, because I'd already suffered writer's block once. I was afraid it was going to happen again. And she said something that changed my life. She said, well, the wrong person is writing the book, which was not initially all that helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I was sure she meant that my agent should be writing the book. <laughs> or, or personality disorders. Yes, like exactly, <laughs> the other, the other <laughs> Louise. <laughs> well, actually, in some ways she did, And because I, I asked her what you mean. And she said, your critic is writing the book. Hmm. And she said, what you need to do for the first draft is let 
your creative spirit right first. Just write. Write with joy, write with gratitude, write with awareness of how lucky you are. Just write, and it's not going to be correct. It's not going to be perfect, nor should it be. Just let, say hello, say goodbye to the critic, thank her, close the door, don't lock it, because you're going to need her later. But just write, write. And if you want to write 10 pages on a, a water bottle, that's fine, because it's not going to end up in the final draft. Just write. Mm -hmm. And so I did. I went back, I threw away the entire first draft, and I started again, and I just wrote with joy. And then I invited the critic in, and we started cutting away. And so that's become my process. And that second book, A Fatal Grace, was the first book to win uh, the Agatha Award for best hmm. novel in the US, which was, for me, just incredible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, when I stood up there and I accepted the award, I was almost in tears because I knew what almost happened, that it, it came so close to not, not being. And that, so that's what I do now. With the first draft, I just give myself permission to just write, because it's all exploratory. I know the story, I know the themes, I know the characters, but I need to be open to inspiration. And, and sometimes, I mean, you talked about the characters, sometimes they, they change names, sometimes they change sex, sometimes horses become people, dogs become horses, you know. <laughs> it's, it's just a mess. If you read a first draft, it would be, it would be unrecognizable as a book. And then, we, we all have, you know, different writers have different processes. So mine is to take this big pile of merd and winnow it down. Other, other writers are much more precise. They, they, they take the pieces of clay and they carefully place it. And I have, I have writer friends who do that and they end up with, in the first draft, because they've thought a lot about it and they've structured they end up with exquisite works. Mine have to come, I have to have this big pile, and I, I winnow down through different drafts until I end up with what I hope is an exquisite work. Finally, in the final draft, every word has to have a purpose. It, and I hope it's not obvious when you're reading it. When, I'm reading, when you're reading it, I hope it just reads like it just flew out in the first... <laughs> not, not quite like that. <laughs> but but that, that it wasn't as, as, as wrought as, as it actually was. Well, I was um, just kind of, you know, pawing through my little notes here for a second ago and thinking, yeah, she uh, answered that one. <laughs> um, yeah, this page is pretty much shot. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, and that one too. <laughs> All I have left to say is, I do have one more, and then we want to open it up to, to I was going to say all of you, but probably not all of you, but I'll get there in a second. Oh, how many other people here besides me would like to move to Three Pines? No. Yeah. We would ruin the town, but you'd like us a lot. You know? Yeah, yeah, fresh blood. Perfect, come on. Yeah. So first of all, thank you. It's oh, great to talk with you. Terry, always, thank you. This always, is so always. exciting to be here in Seattle for the, as I said, for the world launch. So thank you all for coming out. Mm -hmm. And well, I want to answer your cool. questions as well. And thank you to Terry. Before I forget, I also really want to thank the University Bookstore, too. Absolutely. They are fantastic. Yes. Um, <laughs> I. I can't see that well, and I think there's a microphone there. And so if you would like to, we're gonna, actually this is how it's gonna go. You feel free to ask questions. Trust me, I'm gonna cut it off at some point because Louise has to sign books. And I'm looking out there thinking, I'm going home. I'm not sticking around <laughs> for the signing. And I will sign, I do wanna let you know, I'm, I will stay here till tomorrow morning to sign books. So no, no worry, I'm here as long as it takes. I, and it's, this is the reward. You know, for, for That's months great. and months of, of work. So let's get some questions and then we'll, Perfect. off we go. You know, in your books, the relationship between the English speaking and the French speaking is, is pretty collegial, you know, a little friction or different cultures uh, described a little bit. But is there more you can tell us about what it's like to live in Quebec and, uh, 
and what the relationship is between English-speaking and French-speaking people? That's a very good question. Um, I could live anywhere in the world, and I choose to live there. I'm, I'm an Anglo-Canadian. I was born and raised in Toronto. Um, I moved to, to Quebec with not a great deal of French uh, as an adult. I, I made a whole lot of mistakes. I moved to Quebec City knowing that, because I'm extremely, I once took a, a personality test out of one of those magazines. <laughs> Do you know when they, they ask, and the idea yeah. is to try to find your cardinal quality. Is it kindness? Is it patience? Is it love? What is your cardinal quality? And after finishing this whole long thing, it turns out that my cardinal quality um, is sloth. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think that was even one of the options, but apparently. <laughs> so I knew that if I moved to Montreal, I could live there perfectly well as an Anglophone and not, not learn much French at all. So I moved to Quebec City, where I would have, which is almost unilingual French, and I would have to learn. But I still made, I remember sitting in a cab asking the, the driver, <laughs> I wanted to go to the train station. And it turns out that I, I asked him to take me to the war. <laughs> and he was so great, he turned around and he said, which war exactly? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I ordered flaming mice in a restaurant. Yeah. And you know, you know, because I say it, I ask, and I, I don't realize I've said anything wrong, except for the look on the people's faces. <laughs> you know, and they're, they're not angry, they're not upset, they're afraid. <laughs> So the, 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 the reality is, on, on the ground, and now I've learned you know, French, obviously, um, I think. I don't know what I'm actually speaking, but people have learned to be polite. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. Where I live, we move back and forth between French and English. You know, you're, you're speaking to someone in French, and, and then it turns out that they're also an Anglophone after a while, and we're both speaking French, and it's... it's, it's it is, I don't want to idealize it, because many of you know that the political situation there is, can be extremely volatile, but that is in many ways at the political level. At the street level, the people actually get along quite well. Um, so it, it gets very, I get very frustrated when it's the, the fan, the, the flames are fanned, because it's, it's often unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I just finished Beautiful Mystery. I've been reading your books in order. But I had already read How the Light Gets In. I wonder if you could, I think you might have to, yes. Yeah, there you okay. go. Okay. I just finished reading Beautiful Mystery. And. Um, if I could just ask. I mean, and just, it's not set in Three Pines. And I was right. like, oh, okay. This is different. <laughs> and could you address that? Yes. But I also just, I was afraid that you were going to let something out of the bag, which obviously you didn't. Uh, but I do want to say that one of the difficulties now with a series mm -hmm. is that they are so intertwined now that I'm, I'm always afraid when questions are asked that people are inadvertently going to uh, let something out, uh, a spoiler. So it's, it, in fact, it, it, instead of being 11 books, it is one long book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it's, it might actually be best if instead of asking questions, you just gave a series of compliments. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll answer that question. Well, let's see. So, We're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, what happened was, I thought, first of all, as I said, I didn't think the books would even be published. So I didn't really give huge thought, although I did give some thought to the fact that I was creating this tiny little environment that may not sustain the murder rate if <laughs> the books go on. Which, of course, then I was so lucky that the, the book series did, but by the third book, it became clear that, that there probably was a series here and that, that the career was underway and that I may end up writing for, for 30 or 40 years and, and by then, Three Pines would be decimated. <laughs> so I, I, I had to, and it was also becoming more and more difficult to describe it as an idyllic place when obviously. <laughs> so I, and they still don't lock their doors. You know, you kind of wonder. Mm -hmm. You do, and I sort of think, well, at this stage, if you don't lock your doors, you kind of get what you deserve. 
it's a survival of the fittest. But I figured after the third book that I should... Um, lock your doors. Lock the doors. Yeah. <laughs> no. Every second book needs to be set outside of, of Three Pines. So the, 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 the fourth book was set in a, is in a country inn close by with, with many of the same characters. The, the fifth book was back in Three Pines. The sixth book, Bury Your Dead, was set primarily in Quebec City, though not completely. Um, and by The Beautiful Mystery, that was the first book that was set completely outside of Three Pines. There was not even any reference back to Three Pines, and none of the Three Pines characters, just Gamache and Beauvoir and um, a monastery, uh, very isolated. Um, and, and that was done, obviously, on purpose. I felt I needed to kind of cleanse my palate a bit. I needed to step back from the village. And then the most interesting thing happened when I wrote uh, How the Light Gets In, which was the next one after The Beautiful Mystery. I can't tell you how much fun it was to sit at the kitchen table with the laptop and start that. And the, you know, the, the first scene in the village. And I'm back in the village. It was like coming home. And I, I was so happy that I wrote, I love The Beautiful Mystery, but it meant coming home again was all the, all the sweeter. And, and that's what I've tried to do now. If, if you actually look at it, many of the subsequent crimes haven't actually happened in Three Pines. There's been a connection to Three Pines, but mm -hmm. they haven't actually happened there. Yes. Hi, Louise, it's Joy. It's so nice to have you back here again. Thank you. You gave me a new a word in my vocabulary when you came last year, and it's horizontalist, which I have <laughs> become in catching up on reading your books. So. But my question is, in reading them, it, and I don't know quite what metaphor to use, it, it, I think of a belt. You're weaving a belt, and at the very end, you get this piece of fabric. But in the meantime, there's all these strands going together. Oh, nice and I think if I just could read the last 20 pages, it wouldn't be, I mean, it would ruin it, but there wouldn't, I wouldn't be so fraught with trying to figure it out. <laughs> and I'm wondering, when you write it, do you know those last 20 pages when it all comes together? Or do you just follow the strands where they take you? Because really, it is all solved. I have to read the last 20 pages about five times to get it. <laughs> well, because there are, I mean, that's a wonderful analogy, because there are many strands. There's, and then, then there are the two main sort of cables. One is the, the, the plot line, which is the murder. And then the other is uh, sort of the more intuitive, and that's the, what happens with the characters, which, which often goes on, isn't necessarily resolved mm -hmm. from book to book, often isn't, like life isn't, mm -hmm. uh, but often the crime is, mm -hmm. is at least resolved. I generally, in terms of the crime, the plot line, I have a pretty good idea of who did it, um, who, who's murdered, who did it, and, and the main issue is why, and, and how. How is becoming slightly less important in the books often now, because I don't want to get caught up in that whole how is, you know, that's, that for me is less interesting than the why, so I don't want to be sidetracked. So yes, that part I know. The last 20 pages is often, by then it's the exposition of who, of who did it, but then it's also a lot of the character issues are discussed and, and somewhat semi-resolved. And a lot of those, like, I, I, I won't talk about it specifically, but at the end of The Long Way Home, I did not know that that was how it was going to end until I got mm. there. I had mm. absolutely no idea that that was what mm. was going to happen. And then when it happened, I realized that, of course. It had to happen. It had to happen like that. It mm -hmm. had to happen. And, and, and that there was a grace to that as well, to that final gesture. I love the bistro, so I would like to know how you choose the menu. <laughs> that's a good one. That, that's what, good. When I write, it's, 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 it's evolved a little bit now, but uh, in the past it was with the fireplace there and the dog, the golden retriever on the, <laughs> on the carpet and, and Michael across the way, and my laptop, and I, I'm surrounded by poetry books and cookbooks. And so when there's a, 
a scene in the bistro and it's winter, I will get out the winter cookbooks and, and if, if it's lunch, it'll often be like soup or something. So I'll look up winter soups mm -hmm. and there's some wonderful Quebecois cookbooks. So I'll often try to rely on those seasonal um, um, cookbooks. So it's, mm -hmm. I have a wonderful time. I'm myself, I'm not a cook. Are you a cook? Mm -hmm. you, you are? Yes. Oh. One of my two talents. Really? Mm -hmm. What's the other? <laughs> I'm not talking about the other. <laughs> this is your show. Yeah. These are your people. Um, I wish I was a cook. Um, I'm a gardener. I love garden, gardening. Um, but I love to eat. So, so that's how I decide on the menu. Um. Hmm. All your characters are, are unique. Um, and they're all wonderful. And I, earlier you said that you tried to write about people you wanted to be friends with. Are there any of the characters that, are, that you have written about that you've drawn inspiration from a friend or someone you know? Mm. Uh, did you all hear the question? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, are any of the characters drawn from real life friends? Yeah, friends or people that you've known. Yes, for sure. Many of them are inspired by people I know. And then it's, it's a little bit like what I was saying before, the real life people and then the what if. And then I um, impose my own needs on them. So many of the, 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 the core can be the friends and then I fictionalize from there. I have um, a, a friend who is um, a large... Uh, retired psychologist, um, mm -hmm. coincidentally named Myrna. Myrna. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> but she, thank God, she loves it. Well, why? You know, honestly, I love writing Myrna. Myrna is a very sympathetic mm -hmm. character, so so that's fun. Um, I'm Clara. Um, in many ways, Gamash is inspired by a lot of different people, among them my husband, Michael. So yes, I, 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 love, I love doing that. They're, they're homages to people I love. The mm -hmm. books are about many things, but they are also love letters to where I live and to the people uh, in my life who I care deeply about. Yes? So I've noticed the way that you do character developments, like you were saying, are people in your life or um, people that you know. How do you choose which people are going to be the closest in your books, like, for instance, Ruth and Beauvoir? Mm. Oh, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. about how do I choose which of the characters will be friends? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Clara, Clara and, and Myrna are close friends. Um, um, Beauvoir and, and Ruth. Beauvoir and Ruth was unlikely and unexpected, and that's one of the things that, you know, I, I could not have planned that. And so I think when you write that if you just have the right amount of structure, then it really does allow, you have to be open to inspiration and, and the grace notes. And I think that that was one of those moments where I just wrote a scene where the, where the two of them had a moment of insight, of intimacy, of recognizing each other. And I think it, that's where she probably started calling him numb nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he allowed it. And that, then one of the scenes with the duck in, in uh, 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 how the light gets in. Um, it, it is very organic, like most friendships, like my own friendships with people. It, in still life, Clara and um, Jane were best friends, really good friends. Mm -hmm. and, and then Jane dies. We, that, we learn that in the first line of the first book. Mm -hmm. uh, and then her relationship with Myrna has evolved. And now Ren Marie is living in the village, so we're seeing her established relationships as well. Mm -hmm. But it's, it is very organic and, and in many ways unexpected. I love, I love that element of the books because mm -hmm. the plot line has to be very carefully thought out, but the other doesn't. The other can breathe. I can allow the characters mm -hmm. to breathe. Mm -hmm. Can I butt in just for a second? Yes. We probably have about 10 minutes, a little, little less maybe for questions. So maybe I think there were three or four of you. Let, let's just get through you folks and then the next part of the party goes on. Good. Three Pines is such an evocative space. 
Do you think about the tension between like healing and restoration versus hiding? Oh, that's, yeah, that's interesting, yes. And I, I sort of touch on it in some cases. Um, I think particularly with Gamash and, and how much of what he's going through is, is hiding from the real world and how much is healing and, and, and is there anything wrong at times with hiding? Because sometimes we have to curl up in a ball in the cave and lick our wounds and that's the most reasonable thing to do. Um, I do, I do think about that, that are they so removed from the world that they have um, abdicated their responsibilities to the rest of the world? Um, so I, it's, it's a line I try to tread carefully because it's important to me that these people um, do care about more than just their tiny little, uh, their tiny little world. That they are people of courage. Um, and we see that in in the books in terms of the, their actions. So I, I, I actually don't feel that they are hiding, but it is something that is absolutely explored in the books, any more than, I, I think it's one of the issues that I sort of think about a little bit with myself, living in a small village in Quebec. And I used to be, you know, the journalist in Montreal, and I used to cover all sorts of hard news and current affairs and big world events and certainly big national events, uh, and was very involved. And now I don't take any newspapers, I don't watch the news, I don't listen to the news on, on the radio. I feel that if there is a major event, my friends will tell me about it. You know, <laughs> if the missiles are launched, they will tell me. Um, and other, you know, I, I get emails from people saying, you know, this has happened, we're, we're starting a, a campaign, or do you want to be involved with something, or from the Red Cross, or what have you. But, but I don't need to hear about terrible events that is only that I can't do anything about that's just going to scare me. Um, so, and, and maybe that is hiding. I, don't, I struggle with that as well. So it's, it is an element that I, I appreciate. Yeah, I have brought to Three Pines also. Mm -hmm. Well, I will start with the compliment that I was instructed. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, push off. <laughs> yeah. I love it when I pick up one of your books because it's not just a mystery. And I, for years, felt guilty that I just love mysteries and that's all I want to read. But I, you take me on a travel, you take me history, you take me through psychological thrillers. I just love it. And I love the humor. I laugh out loud. But when I try to translate that to other people, it doesn't always go through. Um, so I've encouraged people to start reading your books. Um, my question is not as profound as the last one. But I went to Quebec City again last year, and I'm on the search for those chocolate-covered blueberries that you described <laughs> at that monastery. <laughs> and we even visited like the places we thought that you put in the barrier dead. So is, was that fiction, or did those exist? <laughs> <laughs> those exist. <laughs> do you know what? They do exist. I, when I was a journalist in Quebec City, there is a monastery in, in an area called the Saguenay Lac Saint Jean, north of Quebec City. It's in Chicoutimi, and there's a monastery there, and its vocation is to make chocolate covered blueberries. They pick wild blueberries mm. and they coat them in chocolate, and then they send them south. And there is like a two-week period. It's like like Beaujolais Nouveau mm -hmm. when the when the chocolate-covered blueberries arrive, everyone goes crazy, <laughs> um, and you 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 get a, as many as you can, and they disappear from the stores in no time. And of course, you have to eat them right away because they'll go bad in in a week or two. So you're forced, forced. to stuff the chocolate-covered blueberries. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a religious act. <laughs> Well, there was our last question for the evening, so let's thank Louise Penny for a wonderful evening thank together. You. Thank you all. Thank you, Terry. Thank you.